Thank you very much, everybody, for calling in. Uh, this is the uh, seminar of the Network for Life Detection, NFOLD, which is one of the now many research coordination networks of the NASA Astrobiology Program. Uh, this is a seminar that we have every other month, but we would very much enjoy organizing it every month if we had uh, the people volunteering to speak. So if you would like to give a presentation uh, in this seminar, you or your students, uh, please reach out to us at contact Come and we'll make sure to organize this for you. Uh, today, we're very excited to have Dr. Andrew Mullen from the Georgia Institute of Technology, who will be speaking to us about microscopes for life detection and exploration from oceans to space. Andy, I know you're very busy, and I'm really grateful that you uh, agreed to talk to us today for what will be a very interesting presentation. The floor is yours. Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Sanjoy and Enfold for letting me give this talk and everyone for tuning in. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be telling you about a variety of uh, microscopic imaging systems. So my background is I did a PhD um, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I was working on some uh, in situ imaging systems for marine biology purposes. And then now I'm um, was awarded a, a NASA postdoctoral fellowship that I have actually finished, but I'm still continuing to work in the lab. And that um, basically funded me to work on um, another in situ imaging system, this time kind of building uh, aimed at um, for astrobiology and analog research. So um, taking a system that is being developed for potential space missions and um, making it work underwater. Uh, as a proof of concept and as a, a further advancement of that technology. So um, throughout my talk, if you have any questions, I'll be monitoring the, the chat bot and um, yeah. So here's a picture of a few of the different systems um, I'll be telling you today. So this robot here, this is ISIN and this is what I'm working on at Georgia Tech and I'm working on this submersible um, digital holographic microscope. And here is an image from a lab test of a uh, euglena microbe swimming around. And then on the bottom, these are some images from my um, PhD research on a submersible benthic imaging system and a toad imaging system. Okay, so as I was mentioning, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the motivation of why microscopes are a useful tool and why we, why we might wanna use them for both earth and space applications. And then I'll give you a little bit of a basics of optical microscopy and hopefully you can learn a little bit if you don't know some of the, the physics of what defines resolution and whatnot. And if you do, it'll be a nice refresher. And then I'll tell you a little bit about um, like detection and space exploration and then some of the in situ systems. Oh, uh, it says you're not viewing the presentation. Um, is that true? People can't see the presentation? And if not? It looks great it might on be my end. Just on your end, yeah. Paul. I can okay. see it. We got you, Andy. Great. Um, so microscopes were the first tool that we were able we used to discover microbes existed. So Hook and von Leeuwenhoek um, in the 1600s um, used pretty simple microscopes that actually were pretty powerful. And based on the morphology of small uh, of microbes, they were able to say that they were alive and discover them or they were able to, to see these interesting features. And then based on their motility, them swimming around, they were able to say, well, these are alive. These are a wee animacules, which is a kind of a, a funny term that I like. And <clears throat> they turn themselves about with the swiftness as we see a top turn round. So microscopes were useful for discovering microbes. Um, microscopes are also useful for small things in the ocean. So. Um, in the ocean, you have the benthic environment, that's the seafloor, and the pelagic environment, that's the, um, the open ocean. And in both cases, here we have a coral reef, and there's little teeny coral polyps that are about half a millimeter in size that build these huge reefs, um, communities of them. And in the open ocean, little teeny plankton form the base of the food chain. So small things are important in both these environments. Um, and the reason we'd want to look in situ in the natural setting, as opposed to just bringing something back in the lab, is that traditional techniques are destructive. And so 
in the collection process itself, you're, you're, you're likely going to be partially destroying your sample. And then also you, you can't see these dynamic biological interactions and environmental conditions as they naturally occur in the environment. So the lab is not going to be the natural world. And while you can replicate some aspects of it, it's really hard to replicate everything. And uh, just to get you interesting, I'll, I'll show you a quick example of this is the benthic microscope that I'm going to be telling you about further. I'm trying to put in uh, some neat videos to keep you interested. So here, this is in the ocean. These are two different corals right next to each other. And I'll stop real quick. This is a, a one millimeter bar you can see there uh, as a size scale and then the timestamp up top. So this is a time series playback really fast. And I, uh, this is in the ocean and we introduced these two corals close to each other. So we, we moved them ourselves, but they are naturally occurring in the ocean. And you can see the one on the left is basically spitting out its gut and it's um, attacking the one on the right. And so they're fighting for space on the reef. And you can see these really interesting dynamic actions um, at small scale in the ocean. And so you can see these little wars are fought in the ocean and they have big effects. And so here, this is a, a camera shot of this is what happened after that interaction over the course of a night. You can see that whole part of the coral is digested. Okay, and then an, a third, an additional reason why, why studying things in the ocean is useful is it can be uh, an analog, a planetary analog environment. So um, uh, using as a test bed for future planetary missions for technology development, um, to test instruments we've we're looking to develop for space, as well as utilizing instruments that have been developed for the ocean and technologies and maybe incorporating them in future space instrumentation. And additionally, we can study extremophiles to look at the limits of habitability and identify uh, organism biosignatures under um, analog environmental conditions. Okay, then, so microscopes are also potentially useful as a tool for life detection. Uh, they have several strengths. One is they're agnostic. They don't presuppose Earth-like life. They're non-destructive and they can be coupled with other systems. So you can imagine an imaging system placed before a mass spec or a variety of other instruments. And so the imaging system isn't going to kill what you're looking at or uh, destroy it. Um, additionally, it's information rich, so you can look at both morphology and motility activity. And there's a variety of different imaging modalities uh, available. So you can combine normal optical microscopy with different techniques to find out information about the chemical and material properties of the material, as well as to improve your resolution and volume. But of course, there's also some challenges. So with an optical microscope, um, you can, the limit is about the wavelength of light. So around um, a few hundred microns um, is about the, the, the smallest thing you can see with a traditional optical microscope. Um, there's also trade-offs um, between resolution and your sampling volume. There's large data volumes. And so most likely you'd need some automated analysis because you likely wouldn't be able to send back thousands of images uh, from a, a planetary mission back to Earth. And um, if you're just looking at morphology, it can be very informative, but there's some ambiguities. So you'd likely have, to, you'd likely want to combine your, uh, your imaging system with um, chemical systems or things such as like a mass spec or Raman. Okay, so what specific biosignatures can we detect with a microscope? So we can look at a number of things, but first is activity. Um, this is, would be really powerful because it's potentially conclusive sign for life. So specifically motility, swimming, or response to stimuli such as chemical or electro electric or a variety of light, a variety of different stimuli, stimuli, stimuli you could imagine. Um, you can also look at the structure, look for cell morphology, biofilms, biofabrics, biomaterials. Um, and so, so on, the, on this slide, we also have this ladder of life detection. And that's kind of what I'm referencing is this is the I'm sure most of you all are familiar with a ladder of life detection, um, but basically microscopic imaging can fall at multiple levels on the ladder of life detection. And then additionally, chemical evidence. So combining normal optical microscopy with fluorescence or Raman or um, 
holography can also provide some material, um, so the index of refraction of materials. Uh, so imaging can provide also provide chemical evidence. So it can help us in a number of ways uh, look to see if there's life. Additionally, um, microscopes actually have been used for uh, planetary geoscience missions. So well, oftentimes as a context imager, which is kind of somewhere between a micro um, camera um, and a, a microscope. So like a macro lens and a microscope, somewhere in between the two. Um, but they have flown um, systems for context imaging at small scales to look at properties of the sediments, rocks, ice, things like that. Um, and so it's a little more kind of evidence and background. Here is the Europa lander. This is the baseline microscope requirements um, as one example of a, um, this is from the Europa lander study in 2016. Um, this is the baseline threshold requirements for the microscope for life detection that they're proposing for this potential uh, system, um, mission. And so they wanted a system that could resolve micro scale features and detect uh, structure and composition, uh, uh, structural, compositional, or functional indicators of life, as well as measure geophysical parameters. Cool. So um, if anyone has any questions, definitely feel free to put them in the chat. I'm more than happy to answer anything. So I'm going to kind of take it to the very fundamental level and then step you through how a microscope works. So how does human sight work? Well, we have light from the sun, it bounces off a subject. Here we have the sun, we have a puppy, and then it gets collected by a lens in your cornea for your eye, and then it gets imaged by a sensor. And for your eye, that's a retina. So a microscope at a basic level works in a very similar way. So you have a light source, it would likely be a, an LED or a laser, and it's collected by a lens and shined on a subject. Here we have our alien microbe from Toy Story. And then you collect all that light from a lens and you focus it onto a sensor, a camera. So these are the same basic elements. You have a light source, a collection lens, and a sensor. Um, and then thinking about, okay, so what defines the resolution limit of a microscope? Well, there's three main things. One is you have to sample the, the image at a sufficient resolution. So you have to have su sufficiently small pixel sizes um, that you're sampling at the Nyquist frequency. So you can see up here. So your pixel size has to be basically twice or half the size of your, your resolution. So you're sampling at a, a rate of two. You have to have um, low aberrations. So for example, lenses have a variety of different aberrations, but um, here this, this lens is, is showing light is being focused uh, at different points as a function of distance from the center of the lens. And so that's one example of an aberration. So you want to have those reduced as small as possible. But then the, really the ultimate thing that limits resolution is the numerical aperture. And that's the range of angles over, over which a lens can accept light. And it defines the size of this thing called an airy disk. So here, here we have um, an airy disk. And this is due to diffraction. Light isn't actually focused to an infinitely small point. It's focused to um, a center point with diffraction rings around it. And so I'm going to go a little bit on this on the next slide. But um, so your numerical aperture is the really critical um, defining parameter that defines how the range of angles over which a lens can accept light. And this defines the, the resolution or the smallest point, uh, two points that uh, a lens can separate or define as separate points. So here we have the airy disk and a high numerical aperture will have very small airy disks and a low numerical aperture will have large airy disks. And here the high numerical aperture resolves the two points and the low numerical aperture does not. And it's also important to note that there's trade-offs. So, for example, increasing your numerical aperture causes a decrease in the depth of field or the thickness of the sample you're looking at and reduces the, the volume. So there's all these different trade-offs. 
Um, and the increase in numerical aperture also typically requires a short working distance. And uh, oftentimes you're, you're imaging a smaller area. Now I'm trying, gonna try to give you a really brief fundamental understanding of what is limiting of another perspective on this objective lens and resolution. So hopefully a lot of you have heard of the Young's double slit experiment before. So if you have shine light through a, um, a single slit, you get um, a wave propagating out in a circular area when these, these black lines represent uh, peaks of that wave, of that light wave. And if you have two slits, you get an interference pattern, as you can see in the, the center um, image. And on the right image, it shows basically the diffraction orders. So light propagates straight away, and then it propagates at this first and second order diffraction um, patterns. And the reason the light is propagating in these directions is because of the interference of the wave. So the wave is interfering coherently in these directions. And in the other locations, it's not interfering uh, coherently. So basically, you're not getting light propagated. And the closer you move these two slits together, the wider those diffraction orders get. And at a certain point, the camera, the light of uh, the objective lens will not collect the first and second order diffraction patterns. And then it won't resolve the image. So kind of one of the grandfathers of microscopy, Ernst Abbe said, the microscopic image is the interference effect of a diffraction phenomena. And basically what he's saying, the diffraction phenomena is this light going these different diffraction orders. And the interference effect means that the, the, the lens itself has to collect more than just the center ray. It has to collect the first and second order, first order diffraction to, to form the image. So it has to collect that center light path, but also those ones going off to the side. And that gets harder and harder as they get closer and closer together. And so that basically is what is limiting the resolution of a microscope. So hopefully you get, this is kind of all a lot of material condensed in a very short packet, but um, hopefully you're getting some good information from this. Um, so you can basically think of the objective lens as a low pass filter and high frequency information is rejected because it shines basically too far to the side of the lens. And so here you can see at the top figure, we have these different spatial frequencies and you, you can see here the very, high spatial frequencies aren't captured. And so on the left, you see the object has these small variations on the right. Those are not captured. But so basically increasing your numerical aperture will increase, will capture higher and higher spatial frequencies. So then we can talk a little bit about some, some more advanced imaging techniques. So in addition to just imaging, you can collect, uh, you can look at, um, the light as a function of wavelength. And that can tell you information about the chemical, um, physical structure of the subject you're looking at. So for, for example, you can look at fluorescence and that's where a photon is absorbed and emitted very rapidly. And so there's label fully free fluorescence, that's auto fluorescence, and then there's stains. And so you can have um, stains that will just bind to DNA, for example, and, uh, and those fluoresce. And then there's also other spectroscopic techniques um, that measure light as a function of wavelength. And this, for example, Raman is one of these techniques. And so that is inelastic scattering of light. So light at one wavelength comes in and it comes out at a very slightly different wavelength. And that varies as a function of uh, molecular bond vibrations. And so typically spectroscopic techniques, um, they can be done raster scan or they can be done in a bulk way, but it's hard to do them in real time at a pixel by pixel level. And here's a, a, a really nice image of a coral that is fluorescing. There's actually two kinds of fluorescence here. Um, so the red is that's due to chlorophyll in the zooxanthellae, which are these algae that live inside the coral. And the green is green fluorescent protein. Um, that occurs naturally in corals and that we synthesize and we use for biomedical purposes. And I took this image um, in a lab and this, was, this coral was in a tank. 
And then there's a variety of, of what we can refer to as computational imaging techniques. And these combine imaging systems with physical models and computation. Uh, so we have digital holography, which you're, um, where you look at an interference pattern of light. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but there's also techniques like light field imaging and Fourier tachography, which one uses an array of micro lenses and another uses an array of lights that are turned off and on rapidly. Um, and both these can provide additional information. So basically there's a huge variety of different um, interesting, unique microscopy techniques. There's also non-optical techniques like atomic force microscope, which is basically a mechanical probe that scans and uh, electron microscopy, which uses a beam of electrons. And I would really recommend if you guys wanna learn more about the fundamentals or, um, or different microscopy techniques that these are two really great resources, this iBiology. And for example, this is Stefan Helm. Stefan Hell, he won a uh, Nobel Prize and he's giving a, a, a talk on his work at, through this iBiology course. Um, it's a series of videos. And then Thor Labs also has, um, they're a company, but they have a really nice uh, course that you can download for free. That's like a whole PDF of, of all the fundamentals of microscopy and all these uh, more advanced techniques. So then we can go a little bit into Yeah, did it, so a question. Did you say the GFP in the coral is the color or the fluorescence? Okay, so the, the, in the coral, that red fluorescence was due to uh, chlorophyll and the green fluorescent protein um, was the green fluorescence and that's a special protein that the coral has and that green fluorescence is due to that protein and those are at the tips of that coral. And here's a list of different um, microscopes that have flown on planetary missions, they've primarily been used for geological con and context imaging, not for life detection. Um, but a, a number of different systems have flown on, on space missions, um, but not yet pur purposely for astrobiolo astrobiology purposes. And so here, this is from the Europa Lander and uh, this was report and they're looking at all these different options and you can see we're co covering some of the, the systems that I've talked about. So there's fluorescence, um, atomic force microscopy, um, spectroscopy. So there's a number of different systems with different kind of capabilities and drawbacks. And I encourage you this Europa Lander report as well as um, this paper by Nadeau et al. Uh, both give a great overview of uh, imaging systems that are being considered for space use. And this is kind of one of the outputs of the Europa Lander. They were saying um, they were considering a deep UV resonance Raman with um, an optical microscope combined together. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, my work specifically. Hopefully you have now a bit of overview of these different imaging systems that are the fundamentals of imaging and then what systems are being considered for space and what variety of systems exist. So now I'm gonna tell you a little about um, my specific work. So I'm working on the submersible digital holographic microscope uh, shown here. And so, so yeah, so this is working with, um, this is a collaboration between JPL and Georgia Tech. So group at JPL has been working on this digital holographic microscope as a potential light detection tool. And the uh, group at Georgia Tech is working on ICEFIN, which is this underwater robotic vehicle that we deploy in Antarctica in um, analog astrobiology environments. And so my uh, postdoc was on developing a submersible DHM to operate on ICEFIN. And so, this DHM basically uses a laser light source and it splits the light and part of it passes through a specimen and part of it passes through a reference channel. And then those two um, way um, paths are combined at the image sensor and you get this interference pattern. And the advantages of a hol holographic system are it, it records this interference pattern. And then based on that, you're able to re retrieve the phase and the intensity of the light, 
And that allows you to reconstruct the image at a variety of planes. And so while a normal microscope only images a very thin plane, holography allows you to image a volume. And so JPL was working on this robust uh, version of a holographic imaging system. And they have a, this field portable system uh, shown at the bottom. And uh, this is, the, I just wanted to highlight the fact that they've done a, a, a variety of work on this, developing different holographic imaging systems and light field systems. And so you could take a screenshot of this if you want, but basically this is a lot of the work coming out of JPL and uh, Caltech as well as Portland State uh, teams are working together. And so some of the advantages of this holography are you get this intensity and phase retrieval as I was mentioning. You can reconstruct the image over a range of Z planes. Uh, you can also recover the index of refraction, which can tell you material properties of the specimen you're looking at. And you can implement it in a simple and robust design. And then, so here is ISIN, the vehicle out we're, we're developing the DHM to operate on. And so this is a modular underwater robotic vehicle uh, out of Brittany Schmidt's lab at Georgia Tech uh, that, um, that, we're, that we deploy in Antarctica. And so it has a variety of different underwater sensors to do bathymetry, sonars, cameras, as well as measure physical and chemical properties of the water. But now we want to kind of move towards also um, measuring uh, biological properties of the water and using these under ice environment in Antarctica as a, an analog environment for, for icy moons such as Europa. So as some preliminary work, I took a benchtop DHM system and did some work while I was uh, hoping to deploy the vehicle in Antarctica and, and took some samples while we were out on the sea ice. And this is in McMurdo on the McMurdo Sound in Antarctica. And you can see some of uh, the samples we're looking at. And then I'm also have developed a submersible, submersible version of the DHM. So the main challenges here, we want it to be totally autonomous and self-contained as well as compact so it can fit on ice in and operate in these really challenging extreme environments. So we have the camera housing and the laser housing here. So this is the benchtop version that they that has been developed and then the system that's um, in the underwater housing on ice currently is in the center. So to basically to fit it on ice fin, I use some folded optics and we decrease the whole size of the, the the optical stack using a few different methods. And so we also, we designed these uh, submersible housing for it and we decreased the size of the optics and then we put on uh, integrated electronics and computer. So it has power um, control and all the imaging in a small compact form factor. And we also have these, uh, we put in optical ports and we had to design the optics to work with these optical ports so that we could image underwater. Yeah, so how cold can it go? It Actually, one thing that's funny, you think this we're in Antarctica and it's very cold and so that's gonna be a challenge, but oftentimes it's actually, things can get too hot because they're in these uh, metal housings. And so usually cold is actually really isn't too much of an issue because you have a battery system and a computer and that's always running and generating heat and it's kind of contained in these housings. Uh, we also had, a, this is a water sampling system with some solenoid pumps and valves um, that was also that I also developed for ice and this is used to basically to cycle water through a flow cell on board. And so with this um, submersible DHM, we can look at this is so this right here we have a, a resolution target, and that is used to to basically quantify the smallest thing you can see, um, get a, a resolution for your system. And here we can see down to things about a micron in size. So we can see these lines separated by a micron in size. And here is some, this is a lab test of the submersible DHM. And these are Euglena swimming around. So this was tested in a submersible um, in a pool in a lab 
test. So unfortunately, we're actually supposed to be down in Antarctica now, but due to COVID, we're not. So I'm not testing it there. But maybe next year we'll we'll be able to test this actually in Antarctica. In the short term, we want to test it at least um, in the ocean somewhere. So these euglena, they're swimming around there around 70 microns in size, and this is a, a reconstructed hologram. And then, so one of the really neat parts about holography, like I was describing, is the fact that you can reconstruct the image at multiple Z planes. So here we have the same video and the top, um, the top left shows the size uh, or the, the plane in microns. And so we're going from uh, 150 to negative 150 microns, so 300 uh, micron thick volume. And you can see, uh, looking at the different bacteria, which ones are in focus at which depths. Yeah, euglena are really big as, comp as compared to bacterial cells. That's a great point. So the, the resolution is um, about a micron. And in, or in order to, to look at the bigger specimen, we can use mor morphology to detect the bigger specimen. But then the really small guys, if they're motile, we can use motility to detect um, motile bacterial cells. And so um, part of the team at JPL is working on uh, algorithm development to basically pull out um, things that are swimming versus, versus brownie in motion or things that are just drifting along. And so that's, that's one big thing, using motility to look at the smaller subjects. And then additionally, some of the people at JPL are also looking at light combining the DHM with the light field microscope to look at fluorescence as well. So you can look at morphology from larger organisms and motility from very small specimens. And how, how salty of an environment can we get into? Uh, that's a really good question. And we, um, so we have some potential work in Orca Basin where, and this would be in a few years in the future, um, in these really salty brines. And the microscope itself, it has optical ports and so has these ports, so it's not actually interacting with the, the water at all. So from a mechanical perspective, it's just pumping the water through. From an optical perspective, I don't think the salt should really damage it. That's something we're, we're really interested in exploring. And I think it can likely operate in pretty salty environments, but it's something we definitely um, are actively exploring. Um, oh, and corrosion, yeah, so the corrosion, but we have these housings and they're anodized. And so the, I don't think the corrosion is, is a big deal for the, the housings that are anodized and we have these the optical ports. And so none of the electronics uh, or optics are really directly exposed to the water. The only thing is the pump. And so we have small solenoid pumps and so we have to kind of test and validate them for salt, very salty conditions. Um, I just wanted to show this. so. This isn't with microscopes at all, but it's pretty cool. So this is uh, ISIN. We deployed it at the Waits Glacier. You can see where it is in Antarctica through a 500 meter uh, deep borehole. Um, yeah, and I'll show you, show you a cool video. So this was just this January and uh, we deployed the vehicle. We worked with the team at the British Antarctic Survey and deployed it through a 500 meter deep borehole in Antarctica. And here you can see anemones that are burrowed into the bottom side, underside of the ice. And so these are really neat. They've only been seen a handful of times uh, ever. And they're, they live in the bottom of the ice and they feed on plankton in the water below. And we were also able to look at the, stratigra the, the sediment embedded in the ice. Yeah. Well. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the questions right now. Um, and if you look you know, here, here we have, we're pulling ice in back up the hole. And looking through there, you can see, for example, yeah, the, the anemones up the bottom of the ice. And then you can see real quick, the, just a really strong gradient in salinity between the fresh water melting and the, um, the salty water below.
All right, nice. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about some other systems that weren't explicitly developed for astrobiology purposes, but uh, analogous optical systems and I think are pretty interesting. So this is a benthic underwater microscope um, I developed while at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And so basically corals are, are really have very small polyps on the order of a millimeter. And inside these, they have zooxanthellae, which are single-celled algae that photosynthesize. And that, those algae basically drive um, the ecosystem by providing the coral the energy to build reefs that are at sufficiently large scale that you can actually see from space. And so here we wanted to basically develop a microscope that can look at um, specimen on the seafloor in an um, undisturbed manner in situ in the natural environment. And so here's our optical setup. We have a, a long working distance objective lens, so we can have a lot of space between us and the sample we're looking at. We have a ring of, and you can see here, oh, sorry. You can see here, we see these individual zooxanthellae that are about um, five microns in size on the picture on the bottom right. And then we have this tunable lens. And so that basically focuses similar to the way, the way that your eye focuses. And uh, we can take images out of a bunch of different slices and then stack those images together. And that's what you see uh, at the bottom of this frame. So we're able to scan over a volume. And then we use this ring illuminator to have really intense light so we can have short exposures uh, to prevent blur from motion. And so here's an in situ image of corals. And we can also replace these, uh, uh, we can replace uh, the lights with blue lights to look at fluorescence. And so we replace the uh, broadband lights with blue lights and we use a filter. And here you can see, this is me diving and I have the underwater computer using to control the whole microscope setup. And we can see some really interesting cool behavior. So these are, this is actually in a, a lab environment, a tank, but um, submerged corals. And you can see these two individual polyps interacting. And so they're basically kind of sharing a meal. We put these brine shrimps in the tank and we were looking at the behavior of these, these guys and you can see it's really interesting. One catches a bunch of the brine shrimp and then they, they work together and they actually share it. And this was in the ocean. We were, we were interested in the feeding behavior of these guys in the ocean in a natural environment. And so here, this was over the course of a whole night. You can see the time series uh, in the top right, the, the time. And you can see one caught, it looks like most likely caught a small plankton. And it's actually, we call this polyp kissing. It looks like it's, it's sharing that basically with the, uh, the polyps around it. So these are colonial organisms. So they're each is its own separate organism, but they have connective tissue between them. And then we also looked at the competition. So this is a, the same video on the top right that I had shown previously at the beginning of the talk and we also recorded time series of, of the, the same corals on the left in each of these four images. And on the right, we have a different stimuli. So up here, we have an aggressive coral, uh, more of a passive coral. And then we have a coral, the same type of coral. And then we have um, brine shrimp that we put in a, a little cage next to it. And you can see it goes right after the brine shrimp in, that were in the little cage next to it, um, where and it goes after the passive coral as well, and it, it starts attacking it. But on the bottom right, the same species, a different, um, a different individual of the same species that doesn't actually attack. So we think there's some kind of chemical sensing going on in the water where it's able to tell friend from foe and uh, alter its behavior as such. And then here we, all, we also looked at coral bleaching. And so we looked at a really small scale. And so coral bleaching is when those corals basically emit those teeny zooxanthellae, which live inside them, those single celled algae that, that provide them, that photosynthesize and provide them energy. And we looked at different stages of coral bleaching and we can see the algae being emitted or the single celled algae being emitted. And then this other aggressive algae lands on the coral and, and kind of starts invading the coral. And this actually 
eventually kills uh, the colonies. So we were able to look at this at a, a mechanistic, get a mechanistic perspective of, of what was going on at this small scale in situ. Um, then another thing we did with this microscope is we, all, we also looked at fluid dynamics at small scales. And so in order to exchange um, chemicals with the surrounding environment, at very small scales, you get this diffusive boundary layer where basically water isn't mixing and it's hard to exchange oxygen and other gases and nutrients with the surrounding water. Um, so fluid dynamics at really small scales are important because the more mixing you get at the surface, the easier it is for these things to, to get the oxygen and to flush out CO2. And, uh, and unlike us, they don't have lungs. So, so really, really rely on this for exchange of, of gases. And this is also true for um, bacterial mats and um, things like that as well. So in order to do this, we, we used a technique called particle imaging velocimetry, where we are imaging teeny particles that we seed in the water. And to do this, we use a dark field illumination setup so previously this microscope had a reflectance illumination. And here we use a dark field where we basically culminate light and block the center and then focus it at the subject we're looking at. So we get this hollow cone of light. And then we take two images really quick and we look at how the particles move between those two images. And so this is just, this is where we did this work. This is in a lot Israel. And um, you can see these different size scales from all the way from the satellite to the teeny coral that we're looking at. And then we can do things like this, where we're tracking the particle motion between two frames. And then we can look at how the water is moving around the corals. So in a similar way with that DHM, we could also track particles within the DHM. We can actually track those most likely in three dimensions and then com compare all those particles and see if individual small bacterial cells are swimming against those currents or dynamically in ways that don't match the surrounding ambient particles. And here that we can get a time average velocity around this coral. So here we're able to in situ in the natural environment, look at these velocity fields around these um, individual coral polyps. And then another interesting project we did is we tracked these fish eggs. And so this was again at Scripps Oceanography and with a uh, Jules Jaffe lab as well as uh, Bryce Simmons in the Simmons lab. And so these NASA grouper come from all around uh, the whole island of Little Cayman and come to this one site and they spawn there once a year. Um, basically over a thousand fish from around the whole island. And this is kind of what the, the, the aggregations look like. And so this is during the day when they're calm and then they spawn at night. And so biologists understand uh, the, what happens to these guys when they're large, but a big question is what happens to the eggs and how many of those eggs are able to survive and then recruit back to form larger um, fish later in life. And so we wanted to study the egg cloud after these mass spawning events. And so we developed this system that was towed behind the boat with um, two microscopes and using a small volume. And here we use a dark field illumination similar to what I was describing before. And so here are a bunch of eggs captured in the ocean. And so this is really cool because we can start understanding what these teeny um, one millimeter sized eggs are doing in the natural environment. And it's important for biological processes and it was previously like really hard to, to understand. We can also capture other things, um, things that might be preying on the eggs. And then we're able to, here I can show you a little video um, is it playing? where it's showing, um, well, yeah, the black dot is the boat and then those, um, the red dots are, are in the size of the amount of eggs you're seeing at any given time. And so we were able to track kind of the density of this cloud in, uh, in three dimensions because while we're towing um, while we're towing the camera system yeah and then we we're able to separate the 
the eggs by size class and do some genetic analysis to show that the ones we are interested in were a certain size class and, and basically um, pull those away. Is the towing causing dispersal? Um, probably very insignificant because there's basically the currents are kind of ripping really strongly right off the, the edge of this island. And there's lots of eddies and uh, then the eggs themselves also can change, might be changing their buoyancy coming to the surface or sinking. So there's a huge amount of other factors. And so um, that's a good question. Um, at, a, at a macro scale, I, we don't think so. At a small scale, that's, that's important. Like, um, is the net itself pushing things around? And we did a lot of work to try to understand and, and feel confident that the net was not biasing our collection. But then in the second year, we actually we went back and we decided just to get rid of the net. Um, and we used a larger system with a uh, kind, of, kind of a kind of a neat towing package where we were able to mount wings onto our camera system and then control the position of the, the instrument with depth. And so we were able to yo-yo the camera system and look um, to that enhance our ability to look in two dimensions as well as a third vertical dimension um, by continuously undulating the vehicle. So here we did a uh, three consecutive nights of this and you can see it was just two of us in charge of this instrument and uh, yeah we we're definitely catching a few Z's in between while the other, the other person was monitoring the toad package. But here you can see um, some pic neat pictures of the eggs as well as predators preying on them and uh, a few and other in, um, organisms, micro, microorganisms and larger plankton in the water. And this is, this was the second year. We have a similar tracking that we did. We were able to track these, the position of all these eggs in three dimensions. or at least track a subset of the, of the eggs. So image these eggs in their natural environment and, and, and make a map of what was happening to them over time. Yeah, and, and here's kind of the result of that, of some of that work. Yeah, and so I think my final um, kind of discussion um, point I wanna make is that a lot of oceanography has really similar applications and a really similar constraints of space work in terms of making packages small uh, and robust and combining a variety of different uh, measurements. So I think they're really nice fields and complementary in certain ways for testing technology and, and further advancing technology that could eventually be used in space or space look at what oceanographers have done and different technology for the oceans and potentially um, gain some ideas from that work. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Andy, for a fascinating presentation and, and stunning imagery. Uh, so the floor is open for questions. Is anything uh, still you have on your mind and have not put it in the chat yet? Uh, thanks, Andrew. That was an uh, awesome talk. Um, I guess uh, with the polyp kissing, um, is that a chemical response or how do they know one is cap their neighbors captured some food? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really interesting thing. Um, well, one is they have some um, nerve cells that go in between them. So, so like if you were to touch one part of the coral, the other would sense it. And I think scientists know that they have this nerve connectivity, but it's kind of unclear exactly how much they behave as a community versus individuals. Um, and another thing is like, are they sharing it or are they fighting over it? Well, they're definitely, it seems like they're sharing it. And um, some studies have shown that like if you only feed one of the polyps that like um, it will be able to transfer some of the, of the nutrients and the, the energy it gets to its neighbors. And so this is probably just a more efficient manner of transferring that by just kind of directly giving it some of, of what it's caught. Andy, how do uh, sediments affect the uh, filtration system of the imagery in your uh, self-contained microscope system? Uh, the, the DHM system? Yeah, sediments, that's a good question. I haven't tested it in like extremely sed sediment-loaded environments, but 
I think one advantage is, um, yeah, well, with the holography, you should be able to reconstruct at multiple depths. And so that, that would help you kind of eliminate out of focus uh, particles. I, well, I guess it would be, it would be fine up to a point. And then if there is a huge capacity of sediments, then it might be hard to track all the particles and it might kind of, um, all the scattering would introduce a lot of noise into the, the DHM system. So if there's kind of little smudges on the lens or something like that, you can, uh, you can subtract them out because it doesn't change over the function of time. And so you can subtract like a, a reference image out. But if you have a lot of, a ton of particles constantly moving, that might cause background noise. Yeah, sort of anecdotally, if I can comment. Oh yeah, um, go ahead, definitely. Yeah, if it's actually liquid, so it basically if you, if you can't hold it on a shovel and you can squirt it through a syringe, stuff that's pretty sedimentary, it's sedimented looking or seeming, when you get down to a one millimeter thick layer, turns out to be pretty clear for the microscope. Um, if it's really muddy, so if you can actually hold it in a spoon or something, or on a fork, um, then yeah, it, you need to dilute it down or something. Okay. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and I, I wanna reiterate too that like, um, with, in terms of the DHM, I'm only a, a small part of this much larger team. I'm kind of de de developing their technology in this new direction, but there's a huge amount of, uh, of research at JPL and Caltech and Portland State working on this um, as well. Anything else, Randy? I actually had one more. I'm sorry. Uh, first off, really cool talk. That was a really cool, like, wide array of both uh, microscopic techniques and applications. So that was a really cool, really cool talk all together. Um, I was curious with the DHM, you showed the Z stacks at like zero, at 75 uh, micrometer Z like changes. Is that something you define after the fact, or do you have to define what you're going to use as your Z stacks going in? So, like, kind of, what's the resolution of those Z stacks, and is that something yeah. you can do after the fact or beforehand? Yeah, so that's the nice part about this digital holographic microscopy is you're you're collecting this interference pattern of scattered and unscattered light, and you get the, the you can retrieve the phase and the intensity of the light, and then you can reconstruct that at any point within that volume. So there's a, a limit on the total vol the total height that you can reconstruct, but you can reconstruct continuously at any point through, through that area in post-processing. Um, and you can also, holography is nice because you can kind of eliminate some errors and things like that in post-processing. So um, yeah, you have total um, freedom of that after the fact, which is kind of one of the main advantages. That's super cool, thank you. Yeah, and it's just kind of like a, a function of how much processing you want to do in different ways to display it and whatnot. So yeah. The question was with the DHM, can you can reconstruct three three D objects? Um, yeah, your your Z resolution isn't quite as good as your X and Y resolution, but you can definitely look at things in, in a three dimensional perspective. Um, I haven't. I don't have a ton of experience doing that. Um, but that is like uh, an area of work of research. Yeah, you can't do tomography on big things because you end up with so much scattering as you go through the object that you don't get really good reconstructions. But for little things, yeah, you can have, like Euglena, you can see the insides and you can see the insides change with where you are. Yeah, at high salts near the saturation, are you worried about uh, crystals forming on lenses or scratching? Yeah, that's a that's a good good question. Um, something right at saturation might be hard just because of, like you're saying, crystals forming, and that would cause a lot of scattering in the volume you were looking at. So that's a that's something we want to look into more. I think. A significant amount of salt it, it could deal with something that's very close to saturation might be might be trickier something that's that's that high in salt content 
I would have a question, Andrew, if we still have time. Thanks a lot for the talk. It was very interesting. So I was wondering to what extent, so going back to the ice fin experiment, which is super exciting, of course, to what extent does the does the the sheer restriction of the size in the robot restrict your choice of microscopy? So you at the beginning of your talk, right, you mentioned several other method methodologies. This might be interesting. Some of them you will never be able to put on an instrument simply because of the physical constrictions of the instrument. And I was just wondering yeah. if, you could, if you could comment on that. Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. So one of the advantages of this holography is definitely um, you can fit it in a pretty compact form factor. Um, now, I, I'll mention that the team at JPL is also working on systems that are even smaller than that are lensless, that are much, much smaller than what I'm currently working on. Um, now, I think, I think mo most basic optical microscopy systems, you could fit in a small form factor that would fit on something like ISTIN. So it's kind of a trade-off. Like we want, we wanted to use a holographic system because of the volume imaging and looking at motility and swimming in three dimensions. Um, another thing to consider is that's really cool about microscopy is you can combine these imaging modalities. So you can combine like an, a, a holographic imaging system with a, with a, um, a light field system, for example, or or a fluorescent system. But at a certain point. Um, like it's just the amount of size of the different optical stacks, it will, will be a limiting factor on how you can fit it into a small space. Um, but So I think you could fit a variety of different modalities into a small space, but holography is, is definitely um, advantageous for, for being compact. Great, thanks a lot. So we're at the top of the hour. Um, Andy, thanks again so much for taking the time to share your, your, your work with us. And uh, again, sharing the stunning images. It's really cool to see the details of the engineering as well as the application. So a really nice rounded talk. Um, if you're interested, for those of you who are listening and giving the Enfold talk in the future, please reach out to contact.enfold at gmail.com. Until then, uh, take care, everybody, and uh, we'll see you online soon. Bye for now. Well, I do right. Thank you. Thank you.